Hello, this is uh, Fashion Revolution, and we are uh, fashion rebels that see upcycling clothes as a solution to the fast fashion habit. And we want to welcome any fashion designers out there to join our team and create and upcycle and grow with us. And we have Clara Berg here, and Clara Berg is the curator of collections at the Museum of History and Industry in uh, Seattle, Washington. And in addition to managing the museum's collection of artifacts, she does research and she gives lectures on the history of clothing and fashion in the Seattle area. And uh, she did this really awesome exhibition that she curated called the Seattle Style Fashion Function. And that's how I found out about her. So, Clara, thank you for being here with us today. Hi, um, thanks for having me. Does anybody want to jump in with a question for her? I am curious about best practices when you're learning about your heritage. And um, because I have an area of my heritage that was kind of passed over, I think kind of strategically by my white um, great grandfathers. Both of my great grandmothers were Cherokee. They're kind of a black hole in my history where I have a ridiculous amount of research on everyone else, you know, like literally going back to the 600s on one side. And then my grandmother's just a name, you know? <laughs> So, uh, but you know, when you, when you're going back in to research that and it wasn't, it was passed over as a child, you're not connected to that community. What are the best practices for like respectfully going in and not saying, Hey, I experienced this. I know what you're going through. My kids are indigenous. So I do have a little, I mean, like close nearby and more and connected with the reservation. So I have some insight, but you know what I mean? Like that's not the intent, but the intent is to honor stories that were passed over going into it with the attitude that you have with it. I mean, I think going to tribes and asking for history of saying, you know, I'm not trying to claim something that is not authentic, or I'm just, I want to know more about this piece of my history. I, because it was, my understanding is that that is very common. I mean, the, the U S system was kind of trying to, you know, it with like Indian schools and things were trying to separate people from their history. So right. it's, you know, it's not a, it's not a unique story, unfortunately, that I think, going into it with genuine sort of that honesty if you're interacting with um people who are more connected to the tribe that you need genealogy history from of just saying you know this is this is where i'm at i'm not trying to you know claim that i'm a cherokee princess or one of those you know be a person who's like appropriating this is like i just want to know more about this and understand so obviously there was some cultural whiplash around that so you know that it wasn't just in the family it was probably the culture all around yeah. which wouldn't set you up for really sharing right your piece. yeah the, there was probably pressure from the family but yeah pressure to assimilate I mean there was a, a time when it was that you know the native people were told the most important thing they do is to stop being native thank you <laughs> and what is your favorite area in history Put it <laughs> in history uh well okay so I I'm not I've never uh been a traditional teacher. I've never taught a class where I've had to, you know, lesson plan and, and have a cohort of students. Um, but I do give programs at the museum and try to be um, as accessible as possible in my presentation. I do both. Um, the two main kinds of programs I do is I do lectures and then um, a program that's kind of changed during the pandemic, but uh, initially was an in-person program uh, called Behind the Seams, where um, picking things from the collection and just sort of getting them out and showing them, um, get, having a big table and laying them out, letting people see how they're put together and ask questions about construction. Um, and so trying to have that as a very like sort of teaching oriented, experience oriented program. Um, um, styling kind of like if you have a piece, it will match with this one and this one. So kind of styling the I know I don't have any experience with styling. This is really just like, here's 10 garments from the collection. And you know, the, you know, the theme is the 1930s. So here's some thirties garments and showing some evening gowns and some, oh, oh, uh, okay. and, and this, and this was something um, I went to grad school at FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. And that um, we did these museum visits at the museum at FIT, which was similar where we would all sit around a table and they would pull garments from the collection. Um, and we couldn't touch them, but you know they would sort of show them to us, and so that was uh, that was my inspiration for that. Wow, good. Were the when you put them out on the table, the ones from Mohai, though, people were able to handle them and look at them with that no, kind of level. No, yeah, we detail. still don't let people touch them, unfortunately. So one thing we were able to do that during 
uh, COVID was that I did do two behind the scenes programs with things that we had done high res photos of. It actually kind of worked okay online because then you can, you know, the shoe can fill your screen and I can zoom in on a, you know, a detail that you wouldn't even see if it was on somebody's feet. You're not going to get that close to it. Are those still available? The, um, what you filmed with that? Uh, yeah, there special? should be on the uh, Mohai's YouTube channel. Great. I have, um, my question is about sustainability. So we're, uh, sustainably focused sort of designers. And one of the things that's happened, you know, over time is this whole fast fashion thing where people buy disposable clothes and throw them out. And, but you're a clothing historian and I'm interested to know what you can tell us about how people um, created and what they cared for and what they expected out of their clothes maybe a hundred years ago that, that they don't anymore. Like fabric itself and clothing in general used to be so much more valuable. And that's part of the reason of the fast fashion thing is that like, if you buy a tank top for $5 and you wear it once, it doesn't matter if you, th you know, it feels like why not throw it out? It's only $5. I don't care about it. Um, which of course is a problem. I don't condone doing that, but that historically the reason there's such tiny closets in old houses is people had only a few outfits and that they, um, and that, also, you know, mid-century, 20th century, that a lot of the fashion industry was unionized. And so, like, I think about, we have a Claire McArdle dress in our collection. I don't know, you know, that designer name, but in, in fashion school, she's like the one designer you learn about that isn't a couture designer. Um, Claire McArdle is known very much as like the 40s, the 50s. She was like the queen of accessible middle-class, um, like just good design. Um, but that was what we learned about her in grad school is that she was like affordable to sort of the middle income. Uh, but we have a dress in our, in the Mohai collection from Claire McArdle. And the donor says that it cost $25 in 1950, which would be close to 250 or $300, which to us seems like a pretty pricey dress. But thinking about that, that's, that was an affordable price point because you didn't buy 50 of those a year. You know, you would buy one and you would keep it in good condition or you'd buy a couple. And historically we find it's very common for, um, you know, dresses in the 19th century to have been made and remade many times. So sometimes you would update a dress with just trimming or, you know, a sleeve shape would change, but the, you'd kind of keep the main part of the dress or things would be pulled apart completely. There's a lot of 19th century dresses that are in museum collections that were made out of 18th century fabrics. So they were just completely redesigned. If you've ever been to a fashion exhibit, you might've noticed that like everyone, every, all the dresses are really tiny. And you wonder like, was everyone tiny? <laughs> were there no plus size people in the 19th century? And one of the theories about that for fashion historians is that it's always easier to size something down than to size something up. And so that a lot of um, plus size garments from the past probably got remade several times into different garments for smaller people. And that the dresses that stayed in excellent condition that were never altered were had started out being made for someone so small that they couldn't redesign them. That's kind of interesting thing too, of just that there's not a lot of body represent representation in museum collections. And one of the theories about it is that stuff, you know, plus size garments are easy to remake into other things and people were constantly remaking their clothes. I'm really curious about the, the research process. Yeah. Like what kind of resources do you use to say like, hey, this is, these are all of this, you know, stuff that we can find from the 30s. Sometimes there's written material, but you're usually looking at portraiture when we're looking pre-photography, um, fashion plates, which are- What is a fashion plate? I'm sorry. Oh, a fashion plate is uh, basically like a, a fashionable image that would be in a magazine. Um, like Godey's Ladies Magazine, probably from like the 1800s. Yeah. Have you seen those? Where it's like ridiculously over the top fashions and they are definitely like carving the body to make it look right in that. So a fashion plate is an illustration that is intentionally showing the garment. So a lot of 19th century ones too, they'll be like one woman facing forward and another woman walking away. And it's a way to show the front and the back of the dress. Either you would go to like a dressmaker and they would have a book of these, or you could have it, you, you know, you found this in Godey's magazine and you want to bring this fashion plate in and say, I want something made up like this. Or if you're a home sewer, you know, a lot of it's like, this is the trims that are in style. Or this is the sleeve style. This is how I'm going to modify my dress. So people use them in a lot of different ways. So there's also information about what is the ideal person who's kind of in vogue at that time. I um, mean, it's always distorted. So much like Photoshop today, 
it's always like not really a real body. It's, it, you know, there's some something, there's some pretty wacky looking fashion plates. <laughs> I don't remember where I got this, but so this is like, this would appear in a magazine. So you've got the front, oh, this is a little girl seeing the back. So it wouldn't be mm -hmm. quite the same, but sort of showing two different styles. Um, so. So I seen, or so you work at the history, the Museum of History and Industry, the collections there, are they from like different eras or do they involve different like cultural aspects? Or I'm just kind of trying to see what all like collections you curate, like that you work with? MOHAI is basically, that's our acronym, um, is basically the, supposed to be the Seattle History Museum. Um, so we're, it, the Seattle Historical Society was the group that founded the museum initial, initially. So our focus is on Seattle and King County from um, around when this, when it was a town um, founded in, in 1850s. So really that's kind so of- just, um, just to be aware, you're, you're speaking to one of the indigenous people mm -hmm. here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. you know, so okay. That, so, so to be honest, so our goal would be to collect sort of the history of the Seattle area from about the 1850s to the present. Um, it is, that is based on kind of a historical idea that historical societies would collect. It was, it was white women that founded the museum. Um, and it was really their story that the museum was telling for, so most of our costume collection does mostly represent kind of an affluent white experience. Um, and that then there was an idea that, oh, any indigenous artifacts would go to the Burke Museum, which is a ethnology history museum. So there's, there's a lot of problematic things about that, that division, obviously. Um, and so we currently try to collect, our, our, one of our key goals is to collect more representative stories of Seattle's history. Um, including um, contemporary stories and, and if we can get stuff historically. Um, so the ideal is that this, this, it represents the history of Seattle as a city and it represents everyone. Realistically, the collection is, doesn't, isn't so representative of, um, we're trying to change that, but we have, um, the collection is very representative, sort of a, a white settler experience of Seattle. Yeah, we're all, we're all, challenged by that same thing yeah. it's not you're not unique in that yeah <laughs> it's everywhere I know the Brick Museum has like uh, some pretty phenomenal collections I was just wondering if that was something that you guys had more of as well because I've never been to your guys's museum before and now it's I'm totally intrigued by museums and all the different types of museums so being a cure I used to work at the Wanapum Heritage Center located right there in central Washington on the Columbia River and I know we've have like a bunch of baskets and dresses and all different types of regalia. And I know more recently, a lot of different tribes, like the, the Repatriation Act, a lot of things are being returned back to the indigenous people. And so I was just curious to see like what types of collections you had being that that's a history of Seattle, like, cause it is true. There's not very much representation of the history of the people, like, you know, you say this is a about Seattle area, King County, but then it's kind of like there's that big hole, the black hole we don't talk about. And so that was just kind of some of my ideas and questions. Your time out, uh, you mentioned NAGPRA, which is the, the Native Graves and Repatriation Act um, of that's making sure that, you know, there's not stuff in collections that we shouldn't have that belongs back with the tribes. Um, so one of the few benefits of the history of our collection is because it was kind of focused on the settlers we don't have we don't have any human remains and the stuff that we have was not stolen from people it's sort of more touristy which is not as interesting but we do have actually one of my coworkers. she used to work at the smithsonian in the nagpra department and so she's kind of the person that has made sure that we're all up to code with all of that stuff and there was kind of there's actually a historical um trade that the museums did in the 80s where again it was kind of this idea that we shouldn't have native stuff when really we should have but they gave a bunch of this native stuff that we did have to the burke and then we um, they gave us, the Burke gave us some kind of pioneer stuff that wasn't very interesting, but yeah, we're, we're wanting to collect more, but it's really about building trust because if we haven't, you know, if places have seen us historically as a white space, um, it's understandable that 
you know, people may not want to donate things to our collection. So, and that maybe stuff doesn't belong in our collection. It may be, you know, that we can borrow from, you know, native museums and other institutions and try to support the work they're doing that we shouldn't be trying to like take things that we shouldn't have. So it is really complicated. I could, it's a very important, interesting topic. I feel like I could spend the whole time on it. 